Without objection, the title is amended. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I request unanimous consent to remove my name as co-sponsor from House Resolution 177. Without objection. Thank you. House will be in order. For what purpose, gentlemen from Kentucky, rise? Mr. Speaker, uh, pursuant to the rule adopted earlier today, I call up the resolution H.J. Res. 117, making continuing appropriations for the fiscal year 2013 and for other purposes, and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the title of the joint resolution. House Joint Resolution 117, joint resolution making continuing appropriations for fiscal year 2013 and for other purposes. Pursuant to House Resolution 778, the joint resolution shall be considered as read. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Rogers, and the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Dix, each will control 30 minutes. The chair requests that members carrying on conversation remove those conversations from the floor. <laughs> chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky for 30 minutes. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on H.J. Res. 117. Without objection, so ordered. And, Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may <coughs> consume. Gentlemen's recognized. This uh, six-month continuing resolution, Mr. Speaker, will keep the government's doors open and its wheels turning until uh, March 27th, 2013. It's a necessary bill that ensures that the Congress is doing its job, even if this is not our preferred way of going about doing it. Funding for the government in short increments is not the right way to govern and not something that should be common practice. It's essential to our nation's financial future and that the Congress complete these important appropriations bills in regular order. However, the Senate failed to act on any of the 12 appropriations bills this year, instead choosing to default on their most basic fiscal duty in the name of election year politics. Over the past few months, the House did its very best to support the core functions of the government and provide responsible levels uh, for critical programs and services. In fact, the Appropriations Committee considered all 12 bills fulfilling our duty as shepherds of federal tax dollars and our responsibility as representatives of the people in this country. I'm deeply disappointed that this work is now on hold and that Congress will not complete this work before the end of the fiscal year <coughs> this September 30th. Though we have found ourselves in this undesirable position, it does not mean we can't yet act responsibly. This CR is a good faith effort to provide limited but fair funding for government programs. It sticks with the agreement the House leadership made with the Senate and the White House to continue government operations at the Budget Control Act approved level of $1,047,000,000,000, thereby avoiding the perils of a threatened government shutdown. This legislation is very limited in scope. Funding levels have been held at rates essentially consistent with the current fiscal year, makes minor changes to prevent uh, detrimental or catastrophic or irreversible changes to federal programs uh, and to ensure 
good government. This includes provisions to uh, allow additional funding for things like nuclear weapons modernization efforts, wildfire suppression, maintaining current border security staffing levels, uh, more help to process veterans' disability claims, and things of that sort, essential. We've also made sure that we will take care of these individual bus individuals, businesses, and communities affected by the recent uh, natural disasters like Hurricane Isaac. We provide $6.4 billion in additional disaster funding. This funding will prevent any lapse in critical assistance to those already working to recover from these uh, catastrophes, as well as adequate financial resources should any need arise in the future. The bill also protects critical funding for our national defense. Maintaining last year's levels for Department of Defense programs, which the Senate and the White House have sought to significantly cut. Mr. Speaker, my committee will stand ready and will stand at the ready to continue the appropriations process. We intend to use the lame duck session to the fullest extent. Just because this CR will last until March 27th of next year, we will not rest on our laurels until that time. We will do as much as we can to allow ample time to complete that essential work. Mr. Speaker, we, we have to pass this important bill to maintain the continuity of our government and to prevent its shutdown and to continue the vital programs and services for our people and for our nation and for the stability of our economy. I ask for support, Mr. Speaker, of this critical legislation. I reserve. General reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Washington is recognized for 30 minutes. I yield myself such time as I may consume. While I would prefer to be doing our regular appropriation bills, I support this continuing resolution, H.J. Res. 117, to avoid a government shutdown by continuing the full range of federal activities at last year's rate of operation plus six-tenths of one percent. The CR also preserves the agreement on spending levels and the reforms in budgeting for disaster relief as set out in the Budget Control Act. On defense, the CR caps overseas contingency operations at the President's request for FY 2013 at $88.5 billion instead of continuing last year's level of $115.1 billion a reduction of $26.6 billion. The CR grants some flexibility for transferring funds within OCO since last year's priorities do not meet this year's defense needs in the region. Beyond that, however, the CR is stringent on defense. DOD requested limit authority for new starts and changes in production and procurement rates. Those requests were all denied. The CR includes only a handful of spending anomalies providing additional funding only where absolutely necessary. Wildland fire suppression receives more funds than last year's level. The Interior Department and the Forest Service have already spent all of their FY12 fire suppression funding in addition to $400 million that was reprogrammed to respond to a harsh fire season. VA operating expenses are also increased because disability claims are expected to increase significantly in FY 2013 as more vets return. Without an increase above last year's level, the launch schedule for the weather satellites would be delayed, causing significant gaps in data collection essential for severe weather forecasting. Increases are provided for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, Child Nutrition and Commodity Supplemental Food Programs, which all need additional funds to meet current caseloads. There are even uh, fewer extensions of expiring authorizations. Only those affecting, uh, affecting spending are addressed. The CR includes a six-month clean extension of TANF. Without this extension, cash assistance and work support for working families would stop at the start of FY 2013. 
The CR also specifies the LIHEAP state allocation formula to ensure the states receive adequate funding for the winter heating season. I must mention two concerns. First, I am very disappointed that we have yet to enact a single FY13 bill in the Congress, even though we passed seven bills in the House of Representatives. I know Chairman Rogers shares my disappointment. A CR is not a replacement for the appropriations process. Federal agencies need much more direction than what is provided in a CR, and I believe this measure serves to underscore the need for timely, regular appropriation bills. Lastly, I'm deeply concerned that the threat of a sequester inhibits current economic growth and slows job creation. The sooner we deal with all the fiscal cliff issues, the sooner our economic recovery will be strengthened. Just yesterday, Moody's threatened a potential downgrade of U.S. government's credit rating in 2013 unless Congress averts the fiscal cliff. I wish we could turn off sequestration in this CR and enact a balanced package of deficit reduction to replace it. Unfortunately, any serious discussion seems impossible until after the election. As Chairman Rogers said, in a streamlined CR free of any new riders and negotiated in a bipartisan fashion, I urge my colleagues to support this legislation and I want to commend the Chairman for uh, working so hard and uh, being so diligent in his efforts to restore regular order in the appropriation process. And I concur in his judgment that we should try to put together an omnibus between now and the holidays uh, in order to get our work done this year. And uh, that would be the best course of action rather than waiting to March. Uh, again, let's vote for the CR and, get, and do our work and get it done. Thank you. I yield back. Chairman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Kentucky. Mr. Speaker, the gentleman I will introduce next uh, has served on the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee for over 30 years, as has the previous speaker, Mr. Dix, served over 30 years as well. These two gentlemen, the previous speaker and the upcoming speaker, are the House's experts in my judgment on military matters. So I yield all the time he may consume to the former chairman of the full committee, and also now the chairman of the Defense Subcommittee, Bill Young of Florida. Jim from Florida is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Speaker, I use this time to rise to present the, the Defense Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2013. And that's what I had planned to do, but then all of a sudden I realized I already did that two months ago. And the House, in a strong bipartisan vote, of more than 330 votes passed this good bill that Mr. Dix and I had worked so long and hard to prepare and to present. And we were really excited about getting to the Senate and having the Senate make their mark and then go to conference and get this bill on the law books. It's important that our national defense, that the members of our military have some certainty in what they're going to be able to do in the next fiscal year. But that was not to be. We were rolling along with that bill, and we had passed seven other bill, appropriations bills, thanks to Mr. Rogers getting us back to regular order. His committee had already voted out all but one of the appropriations bills. We had passed seven in the House before we got the message. The Senate leader said, the Senate will pass no appropriations bills this year. There's something wrong with that. I like to read the Constitution, and I recommend it. It's, it's good reading. Article 1, Section 9 says that no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. Well, that's what it means to pass these appropriations bills. The end of the fiscal year is only a few weeks away. This Constitution would come into play. The government would have no money to function. Portions of the government would have to be closed down. You've heard it referred to, a government shutdown. Well, we're going to have to pass this CR because we don't want a government shutdown. The Defense Appropriations Bill was a very good bill. It was a bipartisan bill. 
and there were some great initiatives that we had included and the House supported in that bill. We got to keep two of those initiatives as anomalies, and that's all. So it's important that we get back to the, the as soon as the Congress reconvenes when it does, to get back to this defense appropriations bill and pass it for sure. One of the anomalies had to do with prohibiting the Air Force from undertaking any of the new aircraft re retirements or relocations of aircraft and associated missions, missions that were identified in their fiscal year 2013 budget request. That needs to be in here. This affects all of our states, all of our governors, all of our adjutant generals weighed in on this issue. We did get that into the, as an anomaly in the bill. But we need to get to work on this defense appropriations bill as soon as we possibly can and get it into law so that our military, the members of our military, the men and women who wear the uniform, those at the Pentagon who do the management, who do the, the, the planning, uh, they have to know what it is they're going to be able to do. What money will they have available? And then they're facing sequestration, which also has to be avoided somehow, one way or another. But when the Constitution is ignored, which is happening with our brothers and sisters in the other body, things don't work right. And we've got to get them right. In the lame duck session, we have got to take care of these problems and get to work on this defense appropriations bill. And we've got to find some way to persuade those who serve in the other body. If their leadership doesn't want to do it, there are ways to apply pressure to the leadership to get the job done that the Constitution requires. Mr. Speaker, I thank Chairman Rogers for the good job he's done, and I thank him for the time that he has given to me today. And I yield back. The gentleman from Kentucky reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Washington. Uh, I yield two and a half minutes to the gentlewoman from uh, Ohio, Ms. Kaptur. The gentlelady from Ohio is recognized for two and one half minutes. I thank uh, Ranking Member Dix for yielding, and uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise reluctantly uh, to support this six month. Fiscal 2013 Continuing Resolution. It is unfortunate we have before us a continuing resolution that only kicks the can down the road a bit, again, but does not represent the regular order our institution must return to for sound governance of our republic. House Republicans have left the House with no choice but to support this measure or we will face another government shutdown. I'm sure we will hear from our Republican colleagues that the Senate didn't pass any appropriation bills, and that's why we're here considering a temporary bill. The reality is that the unwillingness of the House Republicans to keep their word is why we have a short-term continuing resolution before us today. The bipartisan agreement in the Budget Control Act provided for $2.2 trillion in balance deficit reduction and included strict spending caps for future appropriations. But rather than keeping to the bipartisan agreement, the Republican leadership rammed through the House a radical Ryan budgetary agenda that seeks to burden the middle class and seniors with the entire burden of reducing our debt while giving millionaires and billionaires more tax cuts. That is totally irresponsible. House leadership wasted precious floor time with fiscal 13 appropriation bills that everyone knew were destined to languish. We should have spent our time debating comprehensive jobs legislation, a farm bill, and legislation to save the U.S. Postal Service. Nevertheless, under the circumstances of hyperpartisanship, I commend Chairman Rogers and Ranking Member Dix for crafting a clean, continuing resolution that also addresses other important issues such as wildlife management, veterans' benefits, small business administration loan guarantees, and nutrition assistance. In particular, I want to commend the Chairman and Ranking Member for providing sufficient funding for the Commodity Supplemental Food Program so food assistance is not taken away from low-income senior citizens across our country whose calls at food banks have gone up 20 percent. The Commodity Supplemental Food Program is a vital weapon in our fight against the real hunger that millions of our fellow citizens confront daily. 
97% of these individuals are low-income seniors. The program needed a slight increase to keep up with real food inflation. And rather than provide the resources to keep up with inflation, the House Republican FY13 appropriation bill proposed to slash funding. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, might I have an additional 15 seconds? I, I yield additional 15 seconds. I thank the gentleman. Generally, it's recognized. 15 seconds. Thank you. Uh, the appropriation bill pro would have resulted in 55,000 participants, predominantly seniors, being cut off vital nutrition assistance per month. So I'm pleased that this CR provides their necessary support. And while I regret that House Republican leaders favor kicking the can down the road instead of addressing the important budgetary issues America faces, I urge my colleagues to adopt this resolution so we can prevent the Republicans from forcing another potential government shutdown. I yield back my remaining time. Time and expired. Gentleman from Kentucky. I reserve my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Washington. I yield two minutes to the distinguished gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Viskoski. Gentleman from Indiana is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I rise today to express my great appreciation for the tireless efforts uh, Chairman Rogers and Ranking Member Dix have expended in this Congress and this fiscal year. They, the other committee members and the committee staff that applied their expertise and a tremendous amount of energy and effort in their attempt to return the appropriations process to the regular order. To their credit, Chairman Rogers and Mr. Dix have allowed this body to pass over a majority of our bills. But while I support the continuing resolution, I am abjectly disappointed that the Congress is once again going to fail in one of its most fundamental responsibilities. We are all elected to make discrete decisions about federal programs by being unable or unwilling to pass individually negotiated appropriation bills. We are doing a great disservice to our constituents and to our country by not providing the guidance necessary for federal programs to operate effectively. As a ranking member of the Energy and Water Subcommittee, I would like to highlight the National, National Nuclear Security Administration as an example of where this CR does not provide the necessary oversight for good government. The agency is plagued by dramatic cost increases on nearly every major task under its jurisdiction. The poster child of this inability to accurately estimate costs is the life extension program for the B-61 bomb, the price tag of which has gone from four to ten billion dollars. And I would also be remiss if I did not mention my disappointment that an anomaly for the United States Enrichment Corporation is included in the CR. The government has subsidized this company for far too long, and we shouldn't continue to throw good money after bad. I believe that the national security arguments for this program are inconsistent and unpersuasive, and while USAC may have a pressing need for a bailout, there is no immediate defense requirement. In closing, I do support the CR because it is timely and bipartisan, but we need to break the habit of perpetually kicking every hard decision and deadline down the road. Thank you very much. The time of the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Kentucky. I reserve the balance of time. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, I yield two minutes to this gentlelady from uh, New York, uh, the ranking member of the foreign, uh, State and Foreign Operations Subcommittee. Ms. Lowy. The lady from New York is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of the continuing resolution. Two of Congress's primary responsibilities are setting federal spending levels and being a good steward of taxpayer dollars. We should all agree that is best accomplished when we comb through the budget line by line to enact responsible spending bills. That became impossible when the majority walked away from the agreement in last year's Budget Control Act. As a result, the House engaged in a futile attempt to adopt bills that simply don't add up to the spending levels already agreed upon. A temporary blanket extension of funding 
doesn't allow us to prioritize increased investments in STEM education, biomedical research, clean energy, infrastructure, advanced manufacturing and job training initiatives that will grow our economy and create jobs. And a CR also inhibits our efforts to root out wasteful spending. I will support this bill. We must keep the government operating. However, next year, we must work across the aisle to ensure adequate investments and activities that will facilitate economic growth and best serve our national interests. I would also like to take a moment to thank my good friend, Norm Dix. It has been a privilege to serve on the committee with you, and your expertise, steady hand, and leadership will be greatly missed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentlelady yields back. Gentleman from Washington. Yes, I yield uh, two minutes to the distinguished gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Price, who's the ranking member on the Homeland Security Subcommittee. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chairman, a continuing resolution is a sign that a budget has failed. And this appropriations process was destined to fail from the start as Republicans unilaterally abandoned the Budget Control Act's statutory spending caps in favor of the unworkable caps in the Ryan budget. This six-month stopgap spending bill proves that the Ryan budget is a lemon. A lemon's a car that won't start, and the Ryan budget is still a non-starter because it's out of step with the Budget Control Act, with our priorities, and with our values. While the CR avoids the worst of the Ryan budget's cuts to education, infrastructure, and research, this isn't the way Congress should be budgeting. We should be considering final appropriations bill for Homeland Security and other agencies, or an omnibus bill that would provide certainty about funding levels for fiscal 2013. The whole notion of a six-month CR begs the question, if we can pass a six-month bill, why not return to the regular order and pass a 12-month bill? I'm pleased that the CR incorporates a number of anomalies which accommodate the Department of Homeland Security's need for flexibility in both cybersecurity and Customs and Border Protection personnel. By providing funds for both the Einstein III system and for federal network security, we're ensuring the federal government is prepared to tackle the next generation of cyber attacks before they disrupt the federal network. On the other hand, I remain concerned that by not enacting the committee product, we're providing inadequate funding for both FEMA first responder grants and for the Science and Technology Directorate. These accounts were badly underfunded in 2012, and passing a CR rather than our 2013 bill continues the shortfall. Now, the CR, some say, at least lets us keep the government open. Well, we're really in bad shape if the best we can say for ourselves is that we're keeping the government open. Uh, that sets the bar pretty low. Any such claim of success simply underscores how low that bar was set earlier in the current Congress as House Republicans forced the country to lurch from one manufactured crisis to the other. Gentlemen, we must do for one additional minute. Or not. <laughs> Jump from Kentucky. Mr. Speaker, uh, I yield myself such time as I may consume to engage with the ranking member and clarify some apparent uh, confusion on this CR's provision uh, regarding cybersecurity, if the gentleman would uh, engage. The language in uh, Section 137 of the CR regarding cybersecurity is explicit and clear. The phrase that's apparently in question refers solely to the federal network security program. Federal, security, uh, federal network security is a limited program that provides security systems on government networks, not private. So no funds are for any new executive order. No funds or language expand any DHS authorities, and none of the funds or language in this section have anything to do with the regulation of private sector infrastructure. And we've confirmed that in writing with the Department of Homeland Security. Without this anomaly, the uh, program will be suspended due to lack of available funding, and the monitoring of federal civilian networks will be further delayed, leaving them vulnerable to infiltration and subsequent breach. Uh, and that's all we're trying to do uh, is to prevent, uh, to prevent is, that, is with this provision. 
Uh, let me also add that uh, this provision is an abbreviated version of what's contained in both the House passed and Senate reported fiscal year 13 appropriations bills, something our committees have been working on all year. With all of that said, I, I will now yield to the uh, committee's distinguished ranking member, Mr. Dix, who I believe agrees with this clarification. And I yield. The chairman yield? Yield. I thank the distinguished chairman for yielding on this vital matter, and I completely concur with his stated clarification on this CR's funding and language regarding cybersecurity. I strongly supported the inclusion of this anomaly and see it as essential, but also limited in scope to only the securing of our vulnerable federal civilian networks. This provision does not intrude upon the authorizer's jurisdiction or enable a new executive order in any way. Again, I thank the chairman for yielding to me on this issue, and I yield back. I yield back. Gentleman from Kentucky Reserve, balance of his time. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, I yield back uh, the balance of my time. Gentleman from Kentucky. Before, before I yield back, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, let me take a moment uh, to talk about the ranking member. Uh, Mr. Dix, uh, as I said before, has served on this committee for 30 plus years. I'm not exactly sure how, how many. How many is it? 36? 36 years. Uh, he uh, has been a very, very dedicated member of the committee, including, and most especially, the Defense Subcommittee, on which he served uh, for, I think, over 30 years, 34 years. And before that was an aide. Uh, to a member of Congress, uh, so he has wide, de deep experience uh, in this body. But uh, maybe just as important, perhaps even more so, is the uh, dedication that he has given to the country uh, through his service in the Congress. Uh, I personally have found him to be a close friend. Uh, he has also been a great partner in this appropriations process since I became the chairman of the committee. Uh, he has been helpful in a thousand instances. His heart's in the right place. Uh, his uh, mind is on the business of serving the public, especially uh, in the military part of that service. Uh, so we're going to miss uh, Norm Dix around here. He's going to leave a large hole. Uh, in our hearts, but in the business of this body and this Congress. And so we wish him well as he embarks upon a new career, perhaps, and a new, uh, a new uh, way of life, perhaps. I, I've got an idea there's going to be a, a few fish involved in that uh, future. <laughs> uh, but we're going to miss uh, Norm Dix uh, for all that he has meant to us uh, this may be the last bill that he has a part in. I hope perhaps there will be something in the lame duck, but in case there's not, I wanted to be sure that we said some words of deep, profound thanks uh, to a patriot who has served his country as few others have. And so I wish Norm Dix the very, very best as he embarks on the next phase of his life. I'll be happy to yield to the gentleman if he would... Well, I want to thank the chairman for his very kind remarks, and uh, it has been a deep pleasure working with you and your very able staff. I think one of the reasons for the success of trying to restore regular order is we've had good staff cooperation at all levels, uh, and I want to thank the, our staff, uh, both the majority and minority, for their excellent work. And, and I, it's been a great pleasure working with you. And again, I still let's hope we can p convince people that we should get our work done and, and we come back in a lame duck session that we can finally put the omnibus bill together for 13 and, and get this accomplished. I know that's what the chairman wants. That's what I want. But I appreciate his kind remarks. I appreciate his courtesy and his leadership of our committee. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And finally, Mr. Speaker, uh, I want to mention staff. As the uh, ranking member has said, uh, none of this would be here but for this wonderful staff that we are blessed with. Uh, Bill Ingley on the uh, majority side, the clerk, uh, Will Smith, his deputy, and all of the staff uh, on the subcommittees and the full committee, 
uh, have worked day and night, weekends included, on this bill, and for that we are deeply appreciative. And David Pomerantz on the minority side and all of the staff on the mon minority side, both full committee and, and, and uh, subcommittees, have equally worked as hard, and most of the time together on the same, uh, same thing. So we want to thank them for the deep uh, service that they've given to us. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance by time. Jim yields back. All time for debate has expired. Pursuant to House Resolution 778, the previous question is ordered. The question is on engrossment and third reading of the joint resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Third reading. Joint resolution making continuing appropriations for fiscal year 2013 and for other purposes. Pursuant to Clause 1C of Rule 19, further consideration of House Joint Resolution 117 is postponed.
House will be in order. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pursuant to House Resolution 117, I call up uh, Bill H.R. 6365, the National Security and Job Protection Act of 2012, and ask for its immediate consideration in the House. Clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 6365, a bill to amend the Balanced Budget and Emergency Deficit Control Act of 1985 to replace the sequester established by the Budget Control Act of 2011. Pursuant to House Resolution 778, the bill is considered read. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Garrett, and the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Van Hollen, each will control 30 minutes. Chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. And I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and to extend their remarks and include extraneous material on H.R. 6365. Without objection. So at this time, Mr. Speaker, I yield to myself um, three and a half minutes. The gentleman is recognized for three and a half minutes. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Speaker, you know, under current law, there will be a $110 billion across the board cuts. It's known as sequester. It will be imposed in this country on January 2nd, 2013, resulting in a 10% reduction in the Department of Defense programs and an 8% reduction in certain domestic programs as well. In May of, two, tw of this year, the House passed a bill to deal with this. That was the 5652, the Sequester Replacement Reconciliation Act. Now, what this legislation would do, it would re replace that sequester for 2013 with common sense spending cuts and reforms. Unfortunately, we have seen a lack of leadership both over in the Senate and in the White House. The Senate has failed to act on this legislation. The Senate, where all good bills go to die, so too with this, or in any sequester replacement bill. So today, the House will once again try to responsibly fix this sequester. The National Security and Job Protection Act would ensure our national security, but at the same time we do that, we'll cut spending. The National Security and Job Protection Act would do two things, quickly. First, it would turn off the sequester if Congress enacted the House passed reconciliation bill or a similar legislation that achieves equal levels of deficit reduction. Secondly, the National Security and Job Protection Bill would require that the President of the United States to submit to Congress a legislative proposal to replace the sequester with an alternative no later than October 15th of this year. You know, up until this point, we have seen absolutely no leadership. We have seen no plan from the President to fix this sequester problem. But yet there is strong bipartisan agreement that the sequester, as it is right now, is bad policy and should be reprioritized. Once again, the President has failed to lead in this area, failed to put forward a credible response, failed to put a legislative proposal, and the Senate has failed as well. The result is that in less than 100 days, we will see reductions that our own very Secretary Panetta says will hollow out our armed forces and make arbitrary, totally arbitrary reductions in other spending programs. Not only has the President failed to lead in this area, he has failed to put forward a plan but the President has also failed, and this is important, to submit to Congress a report as law requires him to do so, detailing specifically how this administration would implement the sequester. Now, Mr. Speaker, after months, literally months of stonewalling Congress on how this administration would implement the sequester, Congress now comes to the floor because we are forced to pass legislation requiring the President to submit a detailed sequester implementation program. 
And when that le legislation became law, as we said, the President's response has been no response. Rather than him doing his homework, the President has simply taken a pass on this matter and instead has provided Congress with nothing and not in meeting the requirements of the law. It is an example, I think to use the President's own word, of an incomplete by this President on his report card. The President lacks leadership, is simply stunning to this member and to the American people as well. As I say, the Senate is no better for failing to respond in this matter as well. The Senate refuses to take up any bill or to replace the sequester whatsoever. So today, Mr. Speaker, we again come here, passing legislation to try to solve this problem, to fix this sequester, to make sure that these draconian cuts do not go in place now. We're not saying that it has to be the House passed bill that passed. We're also asking the President to put forward his own legislative proposal for the Senate to act before the legislation takes effect. The American looked for leadership, and they are getting it from the House of Representatives today. With that, I yield back. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Maryland. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman's recognized. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. This is really quite a charade we're engaged in here today on the House of Representatives uh, floor. Let's just flash back a year to how we got uh, to this spot. Uh, at that time, our Republican colleagues uh, threatened that the United States would default on its full faith and credit, that we wouldn't pay the bills that we already incurred, that this Congress had already voted for, and threatened to tank the economy unless we passed their version of the budget, the Ryan budget, the budget that came out of the uh, House uh, Budget Committee. So in order to prevent the United States from defaulting. Uh, everybody got together, the House, the Senate, the President, and they passed the Budget Control Act. To hear our Republican colleagues today, you'd think they had nothing to do with the Budget Control Act. We heard the Chairman of the Budget Committee, Mr. Ryan, on television the other day, saying, well, I, I don't really, you know, he didn't want to associate himself with that. And the reality is, he voted for it, the Speaker of the House said that he got 98% of what he wanted. Here's the Speaker of the House after we passed the Budget Control Act. I got 98% of what I wanted. I'm pretty happy. So now we're faced with the consequences of the Budget Control Act. What did it do? Two things. It cut spending, discretionary spending over 10 years by a trillion dollars by putting in spending caps. And it created a sequester process. Now, there's agreement in this House that allowing the Meat Act sequester cuts to take place would really be a really stupid thing to do. There's agreement on that. The issue is, how do we replace that? How do we achieve a, a similar amount of deficit reduction to replace that sequester? We hear our Republican colleagues say there's no leadership from the President. They haven't heard any alternatives. That's just not true. There are lots of alternatives that have been put on the table. They just don't like the alternatives. And you know why? Because the Democratic alternatives to the sequester and the one put forward by the President takes the same balanced approach that's been recommended by bipartisan commissions. They say that in order to tackle our deficit, we should make additional cuts, but we should also eliminate a lot of special interest tax breaks for big oil companies, that we should ask the very wealthy to go back to paying a little bit more in taxes about what they were paying when President Clinton was president, last time we balanced our budget. So the president has submitted that. In fact, a year ago, the president sent down a plan right here on how we could take a balanced approach to deficit reduction. Just yesterday in the Rules Committee, on behalf of my Democratic colleagues, we proposed a substitute that would totally have replaced the sequester, again, through a mix of cuts, cutting some of the excessive agriculture subsidies, but also raising revenue by cutting some of the big breaks for big oil companies and asking the wealthiest to chip in a little bit more. So our Republican colleagues who say they want a big open debate on the floor here, they denied us even a vote on that amendment. We're not going to get to vote today on that amendment. Instead, we're voting on this resolution that even if we pass it and the Senate passes it and the President were to sign it, it would do nothing about the sequester. Nothing. That's why I said this is a charade. So we had an option to bring to the floor of this House a real substitute, 
substitute proposal that if we passed it would have removed the sequester, made sure that there are no cuts to defense and non-defense under the sequester. We don't get to vote on that today. Instead, we're voting on something that is totally meaningless. They say they're going to ask the president to submit a report to the Congress. He's already done it. He did it a year ago. They just don't like it because it takes a balanced approach, because it does ask big oil companies to give up some of their big taxpayer subsidies. So, Mr. Speaker, let's end the charade. The moment our Republican colleagues come to the conclusion that it's more important to protect defense spending than it is to protect special interest tax breaks for big oil companies, we can move on and deal with this in a balanced way, the same way bipartisan commissions have recommended. And I reserve the balance of my time. The chairman reserves the balance of his time. The chair would remind all members that it is inappropriate to traffic the well while a member is speaking. Gentleman from New Jersey. And I thank you. And at this time, I would like to yield five minutes to the sponsor of the legislation before us, a gentleman from Florida who recognizes that while the president may have presented a plan to this Congress, that bill went down 414 to zero and to the Senate 97 to zero. The gentleman to, from Florida. I, Yield to the gentleman from Florida. Right. Gentleman well, it's from just Florida is recognized for five true. minutes. I want to thank my colleague and I also want to thank you, Mr. Speaker, for allowing me to come here. This is not a charade. I served 22 years in the United States military and I was part of a reduction in force coming out of Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and I know what these type of cuts will do to the military. But also, this is what these type of cuts will do to non-defense discretionary. The sequestration will put at risk all that we've accomplished in education and weaken programs that help children, serve families, send young people and adults to college, and make the middle class American dream possible. Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan. Secretary of Defense, this mechanism, sequestration, would force defense cuts that in my view would do catastrophic damage to our military and the ability to be able to protect our country. I think right now, Mr. Speaker, it's very simple. George Santayana had a quote back in the 1920s that said, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. At the end of World War I, we cut our military. There came World War II. At the end of World War II, we cut our military. Then came War Korean War. At the end of the Korean War, we did the exact same thing. And of course, we had to chase communism all over the world, Vietnam. And as I talked about, I participated in the rift after Desert Shield, Desert Storm. This sequestration does one simple thing. It takes the Army and Marine Corps down to 1940s level. It puts 200,000 of our men and women in uniform on the streets. It makes our United States Navy go to 1915 levels. Currently, we have a naval force of 283 warships. It goes down to 230. It takes our Air Force down to the smallest Air Force we have had in modern history when we created the United States Air Force. It cuts non-tactical fighter squadrons. And if you talk to any of our service chiefs, if you listen to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he talks about hollowing out this force. We should not be doing this at a time when we all see what is happening in the world right now. When the United States of America has had a sovereign piece of its territory attack, we have had an ambassador that has lost his life, and the message that we are going to send is that we are going to do nothing. This legislation says very simply, we have passed the plan out of the House. The Senate, if you don't like our plan, come up with your own plan. Mr. President, you're the commander-in-chief. Come up with a plan. You know, one of the things that you learn as a young officer, that if you ever get into a firefight, you're ever in an ambush, to do nothing means that people lose their lives. And I will not stand here and do nothing at this time, because those are my friends still in uniform. Those are my relatives that are still in uniform. Now, I did not have the ability to be selected to be on the super committee, maybe because I've only been here as a freshman. But that does not mean that I will not be an adult and present a solution. It says very simply, if you don't like what we passed in the House, then do something. Come up with a plan. We just heard the debate about the continuing resolution, a continuing resolution we've been forced into because we have a Senate that has not passed the budget in close to three years. We have a Senate that has not taken up any appropriations bills. Well, I will tell you, and I will reach out to my colleagues from the other side, at least here in the House, we have done something. But we have been forced into a position with this sequestration to say, we have got to come up with a solution. The Super Committee did not meet its enacted mandate. Does that mean we're going to stop? 
Does that mean that we're going to look at the men and women in uniform and say we will allow this to happen? Does that mean that we're going to look at other people that are affected by these non-defense discretionary cuts? All I'm saying with this piece of legislation is that those who have not come up with a plan, tell us what you want so that we do not have this occur. And think about the second and third order effects that will come to this. We're talking about the people that will be lost in uniform, their jobs. Would the gentleman yield? No, I will not yield, so please, thank you. We're talking about the Department of Defense civilian positions that will be lost. We're talking about defense industrial base, the technology that is going to develop the next generation of weapon systems for our men and women that will be lost. We're talking about a critical decision for the way ahead for the United States of America. And I understand what has been said about this balanced approach that the President sent over in his fiscal year 2013 budget. They had $1.9 trillion of new taxes, but yet it never balances at any time. And if it was such a good plan, such a good budget, no one here took it up. That's my concern. This is a last chance for us to be the adults, to do something, to stave off this sequestration. The House voted. The House sent a piece of legislation out in May. The House voted on a sequestration transparency act. We still have not gotten anything. The director of the OMB, Mr. Jeffrey Zeiss, testified before the Armed Services Committee. He has no plan. All he did was sit there and say that if you guys would stop with these tax cuts not being brought up on the rich, then this would not happen. What is a fair share when the top 1% pays close to 37% of taxes? That's not the debate, Mr. Speaker. The debate is what we're going to do about this sequestration. And I yield back. Time Jones expired. Gentleman from Maryland. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Speaker. We, we've heard before that there was this vote on the president's plan and he got no votes. We had a vote on a fake president's plan uh, when we actually had a vote on the Democratic alternative, which the White House made clear was closer to their plan uh, than the one that was put up for a fake vote. It got a huge vote from our Democratic colleagues. I would just ask Mr. West to read his own amendment, because uh, if you read the bill, it's pretty clear if we were to pass it and the Senate was to pass it and the President would sign it, it doesn't make the sequester go away. No, it doesn't make the sequester go away. It calls for action. In fact, it says the President should submit a plan with a certain period of time. It's right here. It's right here in your bill. Presidential submission, not later than October 15, 2012. The President shall transmit to Congress a legislative proposal. And if the gentleman, will yield, if the gentleman will yield, it says that it will be replaced. If you come up with a plan, I, yeah, the exactly. equal, and, it yes, will exactly. be replaced. And reclaiming my time. That's exactly right. That's exactly what it says. But you know what? You tell the President what his plan has to do. You tell the President that his plan cannot include one penny of revenue for the purpose of reducing the deficit. In other words, you say the President's plan's got to look like your plan. So, Mr. Speaker, the issue here is not whether the President has a plan or not. He does have a plan. Our Republican colleagues don't like it because it says that it's more important to protect defense spending and protect domestic spending like NIH than it is to protect special interest tax loopholes. And I see the chairman of the Armed Services Committee on the floor, and I respect him greatly. That's the position he took last October. Here's what he said when he was asked. Quote, if it came that I had only two choices, one was a tax increase and one was a cut in defense over and above where we already are, I would go to strengthen defense. That is the president's position. That's the President's position, Mr. West. He said we need to take a balanced approach to reducing the deficit. We need to combine cuts, but we also, we also should end special interest tax breaks for the big oil companies. George Bush himself said that when you got oil above $50 a barrel, you don't need these ridiculous incentives to keep them drilling. And we should ask very wealthy individuals, frankly, to pay the same tax rate that the people who work for them do, the same effective tax rate. And we should eliminate some of these ag subsidies. Now, you asked about other proposals. I have a proposal in my hand. I took it to the House Rules Committee yesterday. It would have totally replaced the sequester. If we actually voted on this, it would replace the sequester for defense and non-defense. You know how we do it? We do it through cuts to big ag subsidies. We do it by eliminating subsidies for the big oil companies. And yes, we ask people making more than a million dollars a year to pay a little bit more because we think it's more important to do that than to allow these cuts to defense to take place and all the consequences you talk about. And we think it's important to protect investments in places like NIH, people who are fighting to try and 
find cures and diseases. So, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, the issue is not whether we replace the sequester. The President's got a proposal, I got a proposal. It's how we do it. And again, our Republican colleagues have doubled down on this idea that you're going to protect every tax break that's out there before you protect spending on our national defense. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Maryland reserves his time. The gentleman from New Jersey. Uh, I thank the Speaker. And before we hear from our leader, we have 15 seconds to in from the gentleman from uh, Florida. The gentleman is recognized. We, thank you, Madam Speaker. We voted to cut defense spending by $487 billion. We're talking about additional. And when you talk about raising these taxes, Ernst & Young had an independent report that talked about the adverse ramifications that will come about raising taxes. Obviously, one thing we fail to understand, small business operators at the subchapter, S-Corps, LLCs, you're going to ruin this economy and more job losses by raising those taxes. Well, I just would ask the, the gentleman, I'd yield for one, the, an answer whether he thinks Bain Capital is a small business. Gentlemen. 